I'd like to introduce Fire Captain Steve LaCroix of the St. Petersburg, Florida Fire Department, who is also a certified respiratory therapist as well as a fire captain and paramedic actively involved in transport of these seriously ill people. He's going to discuss the techniques by which um, CPAP is Thank used. Thank you very much, Dr. Pell. Before we move on to the actual demonstration of using the equipment, we have to look at the kind of the 30,000 foot view of the indications and contraindications for CPAP. Uh, we're going to primarily talk about heart failure and pulmonary edema, but in the future you may see, based on protocol, the opportunity to use CPAP on patients with asthma, patients who have, may have some chest trauma with uh, flail chest. Uh, we may see it in C COPD and asthma. But we also got to remember there's a group of patients that we can't use it on. These are patients that are in cardiac arrest. These would be patients that may have some abnormalities in their, or an injury to the face that makes it almost impossible to get a seal. Uh, pneumothorax, those types of patients where uh, barotrauma may be an issue would be the people that we would not consider for CPAP. Now, as we get a little bit closer down to the patient, a little bit closer view instead of the 30,000 foot view, some of the contraindications that we have to consider is, is a patient going to be compliant? Do you have somebody that can follow directions? Can they understand your directions whether they don't understand the English language or they're just not very uh, coherent to what you're trying to get done? Could they have a facial injury that could be aggravated? Uh, or they have somebody who has too much facial hair that makes it very difficult to get a seal? Uh, those could be issues. If you have patients with an increased risk of aspiration, these are people who have maybe have just eaten, they're not as alert, their level of consciousness is low. Uh, we know from our trauma patients when you've got coma scores, say less than an eight, we should consider to intubate those folks. This would not be a good choice for CPAP. Too weak to breathe. They have to be able to have the ability to move air. If you can't move air, that's something that we're going to have to do for them. If you've got a patient with a severely altered mental status, you've got folks that uh, just can't because they're hypoxic, because of drug overdose, they just can't follow the directions. If you've got patients with increased uh, PCO2s, their carbon dioxide levels are greater than 45, you're looking at patients that are going into more of a respiratory failure as compared to a respiratory distress. That could be an issue. Recent gastric surgery, obviously we're putting pressure into the system, we could cause damage for any types of surgeries. Excessive secretions, patients that are going to need to be suctioned, have their airway cleared, it's going to be very tough to do with a CPAP mask in, in place. Cardiovascular instability, if you have patients who have heart conditions, there is obviously a cardiac effect of CPAP, this could be an issue for us too. Persistent nausea and vomiting, we know whenever we strap a mask to somebody's face, it's a good possibility that we're going to uh, have some vomiting either through anxiety or because of the injury, it'd be very difficult to clear their airway. The next most important thing is trying to get a patient who's compliant. As you know, most of our patients, uh, they don't call us when the first problem occurs. They may have a problem in the morning and we don't see them at 10, 12 hours later when unfortunately they can't lay down, can't sleep, they start calling us. They become hypoxic, maybe don't understand. They're obviously scared. They've never seen your equipment before. And the worst thing that we can do is kind of rush in, jump in their face, try to strap something to their face without any coaching or any explanation. So it's very important, and I can't overemphasize the fact of coaching and having a little bit of hands-on, kind of a lost art for a lot of our paramedics. Most of you may be firefighters, uh, obviously paramedics. You may have worn a uh, self-contained breathing apparatus. You may have worn a respirator at some time, even an N95 mask being a form of respirator. All those have flow issues, and you may have experienced that yourself. For those that are firefighters, if you ever put an SCBA on and when you're working hard, you open up the bypass, why do you do that? You do that to get more flow. It's the same thing with uh, an N95 mask that gets wet. It's harder to breathe. We're having trouble getting the flow. Now let's transition that over to your patient in heart failure. They're having some very, very uh, difficult time with uh, getting the flow, and we're going to put pressure on them Pressure is what's doing the work for you. However, there's the flow that's going to allow them to continue to do that. Now, for these folks that we're going to look at in heart failure, you're looking at people that we can't maintain a SAT of 92% uh, with four liters. Not everybody in heart failure will need CPAP. You got people with respiratory rates greater than 30 and they're not getting any better, so it's a sustained type thing. They got sustained persistent heart rates above 120. Uh, these guys are folks with level of consciousness, 
even though they're still alert, but we can start to see some, from some degrading in their, their mental status. Their CO2 levels, we can assume, are, are getting higher. Their pHs are going lower. So they end up with significant issues. These are the folks that we've got to start moving forward to start getting the CPAP involved. Now, when you start to coach a patient, You've got the patient you feel is going to fit. You've explained it to them, not once, not twice, three times and continuous. I find that once I start somebody on CPAP, I stay with them the whole time, all the way to the hospital. I keep a hand on them, I keep reassuring them. If you back off and start to write your report, calling medical control, doing whatever, is these people's anxiety go up. As their anxiety goes up, they're gonna become less compliant. Your goal is to make them compliant. Flow rate is a key. I've seen people want to sedate patients either on ventilators or sedate them on CPAP because they're not compliant. It's not a matter of maybe the compliance is the factor, it's the flow rate. Think flow before sedating them. The other thing with compliance is proper mass fit. Most CPAP devices will have a variety of mass sizes, large, medium, small. Uh, most of our units will come with a, a large adult, common size for most of the population, but if the mask is not comfortable and cannot get a seal, the system is not going to work. So the two things you need to be worried about is coaching them, or three things actually, coaching, coaching them, proper mass fit, proper flow, and then titrate your pressure. Pressure obviously is tied into the flow. We're going to start out low. We're going to start out with these folks about five centimeters of water pressure. We're going to move up to maybe seven and a half and maybe to 10. And in some protocols, you may start out as low as two and a half and max out at 12. That's something that may be individual to, to your particular system. The piece of equipment that we're introducing today is the FlowSafe CPAP disposable device. Now, one of the things that some of you may notice right off the bat, there is no box, there is no knobs, there is no machine that this attaches to which may be different than what you're used to seeing. You'll also notice for the most astute people that are out there that this is going to be hooked up to a lower flow than some of the units that are out there that it can supply up to 100 liters per minute. You're going to see with the flow safe, we're going to be flowing at about 25 liters per minute max. Well, that, what does that mean about flow? For those that, if you look at this device, it channels the air or the oxygen through smaller channels, it speeds it up, is how we meet the flow and the need and demand of the patient. That's an advantage. As you'll see here, it's got a gauge on it, a pressure gauge on it. It's the only disposable one on the market that's got a pressure gauge. It gives us the opportunity to be more exact. It's gonna help us to be able to document the pressures that we're using. It also helps us our titration to know exactly the pressures that we're giving. It also has a pop-off valve. This is an open circuit CPAP device. If you put your hand over the end, the patient obviously is not going to be able to breathe very well. They've still got oxygen going on, but the pressure is going to build up and we could end up with some sort of a barotrauma type thing. In this case, the valve would pop off, therefore it's a more of a safety factor than what we've had before. As you see the device here, it's got the attachments for the mask. We have a strap that's going to come with it, uh, that's going to attach it. But I don't advise to st attach the strap to it and try to put it on the patient's head right away. You're going to find that patients like to be in control a little bit. Let them hold the mask. Let them look at it. Remember, these are people that are not failing as of yet. They're traveling that, that shock pathway that we're hoping to interrupt, is that we're going to work with them. Okay, this is going to be a slow, methodical application of a, the FlowSafe disposable CPAP device. It's really never really a good idea to run in and strap something onto somebody's face. Remember, they're going to be hypoxic, they're going to be scared. You've known them all for about two or three minutes. Uh, they've never seen it before. One of the best descriptions sometimes that people use is to, to describe using CPAP as like sticking your head out the window of a car while it's going down the road, that blowing into the face. And most people have seen that or have done that themselves and can understand the analogy of that or the comparison. So what I normally like to do is I like to ask the patient, can you go ahead and hold the mask for me? I like the patient to stay in control. They have some say of what's happening, makes them feel like they're involved. So I let them kind of hold on to the mask. Now I started out, I'm going to start out on a rate of, of, on a, of the heart failure patient. The flow is going to be at 15 liters per minute or, or five centimeters of water pressure. 
That may be the right place, it may not, because we're going to have to titrate on, based on how the patient performs. You notice I don't have my hand over the end. Again, that could have caused an increase in pressure. Some patients will say they'll start to pull it away. They get a little bit of anxiety, a little bit of claustrophobia. That's okay. Let them stay in charge of it. Let them do it. In the meantime, you're starting to exert some pressure where you're going to take control of it, but let them stay in control. If they get too upset, I've actually had patients throw up into their mask, because we're going to try to avoid that. As they're doing that, you can have yourself or you could have your partner, and a lot of times it can be a second rescuer, will come in and attach the straps. The strapping system that we have here, we have the, the little pins on, on the mask and they just slide right over the top and you've got one on the top and one on the bottom for each one. You can ask him how comfortable is that? How does that feel to you? He may shake his head. Okay. The other part of this, you may have to be popping these masks off to give nitro. You may be having incorporating capnography into these. This is all fine. Some of these masks can even be used to put uh, breathing treatments through. For a patient, you may want to give a bronchodilator therapy would be okay. Again, now you're assessing the patient. I kind of like to keep my hand on their shoulder. I like to talk to them. Breathe with it. This is going to help you breathe. This is going to make it easier for you. Try to stay away from negative comments. They're already in the, probably the worst state that they're having in a while. So we're going to try to stay positive all the way through this. If he's still trying having some trouble with it, turn your flow up. Give him the air a little bit faster. Make it to where it's see if we can meet that. But if he's fine with the five and we're getting some compliance with it and the mask is comfortable with him, then we're doing fine. See how is, is the saturation, are they, is it getting better? Is his work of breathing to you, does it appear to be better? He's not working as hard. It's not as difficult as it was. Again, I would continue to talk with him. Whoever gets that rapport with the patient should stay with that patient all the way to the hospital. They start having a good working relationship on how things are, are uh, working. At this point, I'm going to monitor him all the way. He's probably going to have an IV started. Uh, the, the thing that you got to remember is that most of you will be using D cylinders or E cylinders. The D cylinder, which is common in the system that I'm using, if you're running this at 15 liters, you're going to get about one minute for every hundred that is in your tank. So as part of the preparation, we actually carry a second tank with a regulator on and try to start every call with a minimum of 2,000 in your tank. That way I know I have 20 minutes. I work in a, an urban EMS system, short transport times not a problem for us. But if you work in a community that's longer transport times, <clears throat> having a second, third bottle, second regulator to change out would be very valuable. Okay, once you arrive at the emergency department, you're going to find that you're able to leave the disposable CPAP device that you spent uh, a significant amount of time getting fit and making the patient comfortable can stay on the patient. As most of you know, the CPAP device that we have comes out with a mask that's more of a disposable, smaller version, but the new mask that's coming out, as you see, will have some innovative features that the other mask doesn't have. It's going to have a more comfortable, flexible strapping system, and it also has the supports on the forehead to take the pressure off of the nose. One of the more areas that most people complain is where the comfort uh, issues are. As a lot of people realize that in respiratory, the adapters, everything is pretty much the 22 millers or 15 millimeter adapters. So the valve is going to plug directly into the mask, as you can see. Is we could actually have the patient hold it, as we do in, in most of our CPAP administrations, let them hold it. Only this mask can be brought over to the top of their head and much easier to put on. And then can be adjusted just like any, any type of Velcro to get the better fit. One of the advantages that this mask has over other masks is one of the things that we want to do to patients that are on CPAP is to be able to give them nitro. And every time I take the CPAP mask off, I lose the pressure and the value of the therapy. In this case, I'm able to take the mask, I can raise it up very quickly because of the strap stretches, give them the nitro, and put the strap back down. This is an advantage over most other masks that we're seeing out on the market.